Attention, interloper. Heed this recorded message. This drone vessel speaks with the voice and authority of Urquan. You are trespassing within Urquan space.
This world, Earth, may not be approached for any reason. Nor will hostilities against our orbital platform be tolerated. In addition, your ship does not respond to standard hierarchy identification transmissions and is therefore deemed to be independent. This is not permissible. Only subservience shall be tolerated. This drone now leaves to inform the Urquan of your transgressions. You are commanded to remain here and await the arrival of the Urquan. Disobedience will be punished. Attention unidentified space vessel. I am Starbase Commander Hayes of the Slave Planet Earth. Our hyperwave broadcast is extremely weak. Situation critical. Energy cores exhausted. Scanners and deep radar are non-functional. We cannot identify your vessel. Are you the scheduled hierarchy resupply ship? Repeat, are you the resupply vessel? The starship what? Never mind, look, we won't last much longer. Here's our situation. According to our oath of fealty to the Urquan, we must maintain the star base, but we have no space vessels of our own, and the shield prevents us from contacting Earth, so we're totally dependent on the Urquan supply vessels for everything we need up here. We know there's a hierarchy base on the surface of the moon, but we can't contact them. The Urquam were supposed to resupply the base at regular five-year intervals, but we haven't received anything in almost eight years. What we don't recycle, we can usually synthesize, but to do so, we need replacement radioactives for our generator energy cores. If you could bring us some radioactive elements, we can fabricate the cores ourselves. Are you willing to help us? The fastest way to get radioactives in this system would be to land on Mercury and scour the surface for deposits of radioactive elements. But be careful, Mercury is a pretty inhospitable place. Watch out for earthquakes and those high temperature areas. Thanks, I'll make sure to mention this the next time I talk with our masters. I'm sure they will reward you.
Did you find any radioactive elements for our power cores? We're initiating transfer of radioactives, Captain. Now, as soon as our engineers can refit the energy cores, there, that's much better. Power ratings are climbing. Life support is coming back into the green. Deep radar systems and sensors are now online, and I can scan your vessel. What the hell kind of ship is that? Just who are you, Captain? Star Control Science Mission, huh? <laughs> Captain, I served as a Star Control Officer during the war aboard several cruisers in the Corward Front. And if there'd been any scientific mission to Vela, I would have heard about it. Hmm. You know, come to think of it, there were some rumors that Corridor 9, the Special Operations Division of Star Control, was directing some hush-hush operation near Androsynth Space. The Vela star system, yes, that would be the right direction. So, Captain, if you say it's true, how do you explain that huge alien starship you're flying? And why are you here? What do you want from us? Ah, fight the Urquan. Win back our freedom. I remember having such thoughts myself once, a long time ago. That was in the first years after the defeat, when it was still terrifying to look up and see the bloody glow of the pulsating slave shield overhead. So day and night we gazed up at the impenetrable wall, as though the sheer power of our hatred would pull it down. But over the years I spent so much of my time struggling, down on the surface, under the shield, and then later up here trying to keep the station alive, that I'd forgotten what it means to be free, to hate our Urquan masters. And now here you are in an alien ship of unknown power offering me your assistance to fight against the hierarchy again after all these years. Captain, your offer is intriguing. It's tempting to think that with your advanced precursor technology we can somehow crack the Earth's slave shield and reassemble the Alliance to attack the hierarchy. And this time, win the damn war. Consider the consequences if you should fail. The Urquan won't just punish us here on the station, they'll exact a gruesome retribution on the surface below as well. Before I commit this station to helping you attack the Urquan and accepting the risk of annihilation if we are defeated, I have to make sure that you and your ship have what it takes to oppose the hierarchy. I'll make you a deal. If you can eliminate the alien base on the moon and get rid of that threat at least, I will seriously consider your offer. After the Urquan erected the slave shield around the Earth and established this space station, they decided to leave a contingent of combat ships close to the Earth to keep watch on our planet and confirm that they were obeying the Urquan slave laws. I'm certain they're still out there on the surface of the moon because we can pick up a constant stream of alien broadcasts. Be careful, Captain. There are probably a dozen Spathia looters and Ilrath Avengers down there on the lunar surface. I don't know why they haven't come after you yet, but when they do, you'd better have your weapons armed and your thrusters burning hot.
Have you dealt with the bass yet? I'll be darned. All these years we've been listening to their incoherent broadcast and we never even guessed. Captain, listen closely. Long range sensors show a ship closing on this station fast. Our computer identifies it as Ilrath, Avenger class. I think you've got a fight on your hands, Captain. Your best bet is to wait until you have point blank range. Captain, it's jamming our signal. Breath of the Dark Twin Kazan, a human and an alien starship. How fascinating. When I intercepted that Urquan drone and learned that an unidentified starship had approached Earth, I never expected to find such a remarkable vehicle in the hands of a human. Humans are prey animals, weak and helpless. Here is a human in an armed starship, and therefore in direct violation of the Oath of Fealty. I am sure our masters, the Orquan, will punish Earth most severely for this treachery when I present them with the twisted wreckage of your ship and your many charred corpses. Since you will soon be dead, I will gladly explain. We have spent many years gleefully preying on the Pekunk. They are a pitiful, easily killed species. And we would have continued in this divine worship of Dogar and Kazan, but we required additional crew members and repairs to our cloaking device. So we departed the Jiglas constellation and set course for home. Before we had reached our region of space, we detected the passage of a nearby vessel, the Urquan Drone. It informed us about you, so here we are. And now, you die! What a beautiful sight, Captain! I haven't seen so much. Uh, 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 okay.
I have good news with them, and so our engine with the you have good Have you dealt with the bass yet? I'll be darned. All these years we've been listening to their incoherent broadcast and we never even guessed. Captain, listen closely. Long range sensors show a ship closing on this station fast. Our computer identifies it as Ilrath, Avenger class. I think you've got a fight on your hands, Captain. Your best bet is to wait until you have point blank ring. Captain, it's jamming our signal. Breath of the Dark Twin, Kazan, a human and an alien starship. How fascinating. When I intercepted that Urquan drone and learned that an unidentified starship had approached Earth, uh, I never expected to find such a remarkable vehicle in the hands of a human. Humans are prey animals, weak and helpless. Here is a human in an armored starship, and therefore in direct violation of the Oath of Fealty. I am sure our masters, the Orquan, will punish Earth most severely for this treachery when I present them with the twisted wreckage of your ship and your many charred corpses. Since you will soon be dead, I will gladly explain. We have spent many years gleefully preying on the Pekunk. They are a pitiful, easily killed species. And we would have continued in this divine worship of Dogar and Kazan, but we required additional crew members and repairs to our cloaking device. So we departed the Jiglas constellation and set course for home. Before we had reached our region of space, we detected the passage of a nearby vessel, the Urquan Drone. It informed us about you, so here we are. And now, you die! Have you dealt with the base yet? I mean, darn! All these years we've been listening to their incoherent broadcast and we never even guessed! Captain, listen closely. Long range sensors show a ship closing on this station fast. Our computer identifies it as Ilrath, Avenger class. I think you've got a fight on your hands, Captain. Your best bet is to wait until you have point blank ring. Captain, it's jamming our signal. Breath of the Dark Twin Kazan, a human and an alien starship. How fascinating. When I intercepted that Urquan drone and learned that an unidentified starship had approached Earth, uh, I never expected to find such a remarkable vehicle in the hands of a human. Humans are prey animals, weak and helpless. Here is a human in an armored starship. 
and therefore in direct violation of the oath of fealty. I am sure our masters, the Orquan, will punish Earth most severely for this treachery when I present them with the twisted wreckage of your ship and your many charred corpses. Since you will soon be dead, I will gladly explain. We have spent many years gleefully preying on the Patrunk. They are a pitiful, easily killed species. And we would have continued in this divine worship of Dogar and Kazon, but we required additional crew members and repairs to our cloaking device. So we departed the Jiglas constellation and set course for home. But before we had reached our region of space, we detected the passage of a nearby vessel, the Erquan Drone. It informed us about you, so here we are. And now, you die! Have you dealt with the base yet? I mean, darn! All these years we've been listening to their incoherent broadcast and we never even guessed! Captain, listen closely. Long-range sensors show a ship closing on this station fast. Our computer identifies it as Ilrath, Avenger class. I think you've got a fight on your hands, Captain. Your best bet is to wait until you have point-blank range. Captain, it's jamming our signal. Breath of the Dark Twin Kazan, a human and an alien starship. How fascinating. When I intercepted that Urquan drone and learned that an unidentified starship had approached Earth, uh, I never expected to find such a remarkable vehicle in the hands of a human. Humans are prey animals, weak and helpless. Here is a human in an armored starship, and therefore in direct violation of the Oath of Fealty. I am sure our masters, the Orquan, will punish Earth most severely for this treachery when I present them with the twisted wreckage of your ship and your many charred corpses. Since you will soon be dead, I will gladly explain. We have spent many years gleefully preying on the Pakunk. They are a pitiful, easily killed species. And we would have continued in this divine worship of Dogar and Kazon, but we required additional crew members and repairs to our cloaking device. So we departed the Jiglas constellation and set course for home. But before we had reached our region of space, we detected the passage of a nearby vessel, the Erquan Drone. It informed us about you, so here we are. And now, you die!
What a beautiful sight, Captain. I haven't seen an Avenger blown away like that since the battle in Draco. I guess you've shown that you can handle yourself in battle, Captain. So my last reservation about helping you has been dissolved. I will commit this station to helping free Earth and defeat the Urquan. We may get our atoms rearranged in the process, but by God, Captain, we're going to try. So the obvious first step is to get the precursor equipment and software over here so that we can make it work with our ship repair fabricators. But then what, Captain? <laughs> yes, Captain, we'll do just that. By the way, Captain, I think we need a name for this new alliance we're going to forge. And since it was your idea, it's only fair that you get the honor of naming it. So, what will it be? Okay, that sounds pretty inspiring. So be it. The New Alliance of Free Stars. Now, Captain, I expect the configuration process for the Starbase to take at least two weeks, so let's get to work. I have good news to report, Captain. We have successfully integrated the precursor technology from your ship into our fabricator system, and as you can see, we've already begun minor repairs on your ship, patching up some of the micrometeorite holes. We noticed that your ship does not have an emergency warp escape unit, so our engineers rigged up some for you and each of your escorts. Now, you should be able to escape from a bad situation with the touch of a button. But there is a cost, however. The unit gulps up five fuel units each time your precursor ship uses it. Also, we now have a limited capacity to make modifications to your ship, to refine starship fuel, to build additional combat ships, and to train new members of your crew for the flagship and any ships you acquire for your fleet. Captain, I know you're eager to get to work, so I'll be brief. If you have any questions how this starbase works, what resources we need, or just some background information on the galaxy, don't hesitate to ask. Not a bad job, Captain. Certainly, Captain. What do you need to know? What aspect of history, Captain? Which group of aliens? Okay, which race? The Shofixti are a race of intelligent marsupials who had been civilized for only a few decades when the war began. They were discovered in the Delta Gorno star system by the Yehat, who adopted and then uplifted the Shofixti, giving them advanced technology and cultural definition. Shofixti are noble and fearless warriors, Captain. In addition, their incredible fecundity and rapid maturation rate kept Alliance ranks solid even at the worst part of the war. You know, I once flew as an observer aboard one of their ships on routine patrol. We never saw the enemy, but I could never stop thinking about the glory device it had strapped to the bottom of its hull. The Yehat are a race of ancient warrior clans that have been traveling the stars for many centuries. Clans are highly competitive and sometimes even wage war on each other, but the clans are all loyal to the queen and her royal family, known as the Vipzi. The Vipzeeps have been in power for over 2,000 years, and it is said that during their rule, the Yehat never lost a battle. I'd like to think I'm not a bigoted person, Captain, especially when it comes to allies, but there's just something about those Arilu that gives me the creeps. One thing I'll say for them, though, they possess some technique for moving really fast through hyperspace. They never let us know what it was, but it sure beats the pants off our fastest ships. The Genjasu were leaders of the Alliance, even though they refused to accept formally the title. I don't know if their silicon-based biology is just plain superior to our old carbon models, or if their fantastic intellect were the product of an ancient, peaceful culture. Whatever the reason, I'd rather be taking orders from a Genjasu than any other life form, absolutely. One of the more amazing things about them was they never used hyperwave communicators. They could send messages naturally, and their natural hyperwave receptors were much more sensitive than even our best units. We didn't really get much of a chance to learn about those mechanical beings, but I'll tell you what I know. They're the product of a distant, unknown culture who sent a giant factory arc into our region of space many centuries ago. The mother arc, that's what the Earth press called it, turned out millions of robots and finally broke down. I don't know why the Myrnaherm didn't repair the Mother Ark. Maybe they can't. My personal guess as to why they were sent here is that they're on the leading edge of a colonization project. 
And once the Murnaharm have tamed enough new worlds, the genuine colonists, whoever they are, will arrive and claim their due. Most raw recruits saw the siren as nothing more than uh, warm, breathing pinups. Warm they are, and yes, they do breathe most magnificently, but captive. They are far more than simple joy units. The history shows the Cyrene established and maintained a peaceful culture from the Bronze Age through their discovery of starflight. Before their planet was destroyed in a horrible cataclysm, their world was in Eden. What other group of aliens are you interested in? Which species? The Mycons are hard to get a handle on. In fact, I'm not sure any human has ever had a real conversation with a Mycon. What we know of them, we've learned from their corpses, which I may add have a nasty habit of coming back to life when thawed out from a decompression quick freeze. Mycon ships seem to expend a significant amount of energy on life support. This is probably because the Mycon only thrive in temperatures close to the melting point of lead. As far as we know, the Mycon are the only race to actively seek out the Urquan in order to become combat slaves. Imagine facing a cowardly, mobile clam armed with a howitzer, and you've got a good idea of what it's like dealing with a spathy. Although they tend to avoid battles as much as their masters will allow, once in battle, a spathy looter is one tough cookie. I once heard a rumor, though I don't like to believe in it myself, that a rogue band of courageous Spathy broke away from the main Starfleet, painted their ships black with bright red stripes, and formed the Black Spathy Squadron, dedicated to performing brave and hostile deeds. Like I said, I'd have to see it to believe it. It's unfortunate that the Umga fell to the Urquan so early in the war because I suspect we would have gotten along well with those big blob creatures. At the very least, it would have been entertaining. We know them a bit better than most races because they were eager to talk with our ships before, after, and during battle. The Arilu intimated that they had a relationship with the Umga before the Urquan arrived, but I don't know any details. When I was flying combat missions along the Corward front, there was nothing we feared more than the Andraseth Hit and Run Squadron. Their blazer ships were more than a match for our cruisers, so we stayed clear of Ada Volpecule, their home star. In addition, I think each of us aboard the ship knew deep down in our hearts that the Andraseth had a damn good reason for hating us. Our grandparents had kept them as slaves for nearly 50 years. I still have nightmares about those spiders taking me prisoner, using me as one of their six sacrifices to Dogar and Kazon, their twin gods of destruction and torment. Those guys were almost as scary as the Andersons to those of us in Deep Space Patrol. Their Avenger ships could appear out of nowhere and melt a cruiser down the slag in seconds. Luckily for us, the bulk of the Ilrath fleet was thrown against the Chenjasu and the Murnahan. The Starship Far Voyager under the command of Captain Jeffrey L. Rand encountered the Vux near Beta Mira. Although the details are hazy, it's generally accepted that Rand offended the Vux Starship commander with an inadvertent insult. What other group of aliens are you interested in? None that we had made formal contact with. The Chen Jesu implied that they had met two other star-faring species. One near the Gikla's constellation and the other directly coreward from Procyon. The Arilu Lalile once mentioned having some fun with an alien race in Draconis. But like so much else with the Arilu, they never revealed the whole story. I'm sure there are hundreds more alien races in our galaxy, but beyond what I've told you, your guess is as good as mine. Would you like information on any other aspect of history? What about the war? Earth got involved late in the game in 2112 when the Chenjesu arrived in our solar system for the first time. So let's back up a few years to 2098 when the Chenjesu super sensitive receivers detected a strange signal from the Ophiuchi constellation. Though even the Chenjesu didn't know it, it was the first sign of the Urquan's arrival. The Urquan, having detected the presence of many sentient species, were beaming out an exulting hunting cry. The first direct evidence of the Urquan's intent was the sudden conquest of the Umga, a solitary though not unfriendly species in the Orionis constellation. Jinjesu, distraught by the invasion, were further angered when the Urquan turned their fleets on the hostile but weak Ilrath race. 
A hastily assembled defense force of Myrna Herman Shenzhou vessels turned the Erquan fleet aside, but the invader moved into spathy space, rapidly subjugating that race. With each new conquest, the Erquan fleet grew larger as it added slave vessels to its ranks. Earth joined the Chenzesu to form the Alliance of Free Stars at about the same time as the Androsynth stars fell to the Urquan Armada. Before the ink was dry on our agreement with the Chenzesu in 2116, a new race appeared in orbit around the moon and asked for admittance to the Alliance. It was the Arilu Lalile. The timing seemed unusual and the Arilu were definitely weird, looking like saucer men from Mars, but we were too busy cranking up our mothballed heavy industry we really didn't pay it much attention at the time. At the start of the war here on Earth, we were working like crazy, churning out hundreds of heavy cruisers and smaller support vehicles. The Urquan were busy too. Unbeknownst to us, they had moved down towards the Luton Star Group and were attacking the Vux, who only the Yehot knew existed. Our botched first contact with the Vux took place in 2119, and it was the biggest single mistake we made during the war. After defeating the Bucks, the Urquan fleets ran smack into the combined might of the Ahot and Show Fixty, supported by the first wave of our cruisers. Again, the Urquan turned away from the hard spot to attack the weak, though we just thought they were running away. In fact, the Urquan had found another independent alien race, the Mykon, in the Brahi constellation. The Mykon's voluntary submission to the Urquan brought the return of the Urquan fleets, now swollen with a hundred devastating Mykon pod ships. The last entrance to the conflict was the Sirene, a race of space gypsies who had escaped the hierarchy by moving their vast fleet of slow-moving habitats into human space. With the side set, the last Urquan offensive began. The Urquan came roaring through Vuck space and tried to push past the Indian Mira star system. Their onslaught was barely repulsed and our counterattack made hardly a dent in the hierarchy forces, but we held the line. The coreward front remained intact. Over the following 10 years, there were many great battles between the combined Alliance Starfleet and the Urquan and their hierarchy of battle thralls. Then in 2134, a dramatic shift in the balance of power took place. This must have been about the time the science research mission was sent to the planet of Vela. Our fleets were pushed back from the Indy Mira lines beyond Raynet. Holding Rigel caused grievously in Chenjesu forces and the Urquan, recognizing this weakness, shifted to focus the brunt of their forces on Procyon. That was the last we heard from the Chenjesu and the Myrnaher. A few weeks later, waves of ships hit us from all directions. When Ceres Station, our outpost on the asteroid belt, fell to the hierarchy, we knew we were beaten, but we fought on anyway. Three days later, the Urquan vaporized our last remaining laser forts on the moon and the dreadnoughts took up geosynchronous position above Rome, Moscow, Beijing, Tokyo, London, Buenos Aires, and Washington. We'd lost the war and we knew it. But the Urquan decided to make it real clear. And that's why if you check any of our most recent maps, you won't find Buenos Aires. After the UN submitted their formal surrender, we were given a week to decide the nature of our servitude. The Urquan demanded that the decision be made through popular vote. When all the votes were tallied, Earth had chosen not to fight for the Urquan. We had become a fallow slave world. We were given a month to withdraw all of our people and equipment to Earth. Anyone or anything left off planet would be destroyed after the shield went up. Then the Urquan broadcast an odd message. All objects of human construction more than 500 years old were to be abandoned. We didn't know what the Urquan meant until they moved their dreadnoughts into new orbital positions and opened fire on the surface with their fusion weapon. In seconds, large sections of London, Paris, and other European cities were incinerated. At first, we thought they were going to annihilate us after all. And we noticed they were also striking such targets as the Giza Pyramids, the Parthenon in Athens, and Stonehenge. Curiously, the United States was almost untouched. The flaming rain lasted 40 hellish hours. It took days after we crawled from our smoldering shelters to realize what the Urquan had done. Our new masters had targeted every building, monument, or other man-made construction older than 500 years and destroyed it. In those two days, we lost most of the history of mankind. In some cases, the Urquan destroyed places we did not even suspect were significant. From their positions in orbit, the dreadnoughts blew away a kilometer of land in central Iraq. 
vaporized several targets in the Amazon rainforest, punched a big hole through the Antarctic ice cap to destroy something deep under the surface, and melted a broad swath of the ocean floor in the southeastern Atlantic. Then, just a couple of days later, the shield went up, and our contact with the outside world stopped. The next time I saw the stars was eight years ago, when I was transferred up here to be the new commander of this star base. Would you like any information on any other aspect of history? Well, we have some data on this subject. What do you want to know about? Hell, you probably know more about them than I do, but here it goes. About 200,000 years ago, when our great to the nth grandparents were just starting to play with stone knives and bearskins, a star-faring species suddenly appeared on the galactic scene and spread like wildfire. We found evidence of their presence just about everywhere, from an orbital platform on Alpha Centauri to a stack of data plates in a cave on Pluto to some nameless widget found in a voodoo shop in New Orleans. Though we never found a precursor body or even a picture of one, we can conjecture what they look like by examining the scale and layout of their equipment. Such an analysis indicates they were giants, say five to eight meters tall and twice as wide. I don't know if they look more like a brontosaur or an elephant. Anyway, about 3,000 years after the precursors made their dramatic appearance, they vanished. Poof! As far as we can tell, it took less than a decade to happen. You mean besides the precursors? Well, the only information we have is secondhand based on some research by a Chenzesu historian that I read at the academy. Since Search Sack, the historian found some evidence that there was a group of alien races who formed an interstellar empire not too far from here about 22,000 years ago. The only species in this empire actually lived in our region of space was a race of rock-like creatures who lived in the Volpecule constellation. The presence of the hostile androsynth in that part of space severely limited Sitzertzak's research. He never even found out the race's name. Yes, there is. Aside from the precursor relics we have found on Earth, often in museums mislabeled as modern art, we've discovered disturbing evidence of much more recent visitation. Perhaps you're already aware that during the mid to late 20th century, there were unaccountable UFO sightings as well as dozens of reported encounters with alien life forms. Although we can discount many of the reports as wishful fabrication or traumatic translation, the military authorities of the time kept a secret record of the incidents which were legitimate. In each such case, the aliens are almost identical in appearance. They have white skin and minimal facial features except for huge almond-shaped eyes which are often described as glowing or luminescent. This description fits almost perfectly the Arielu Lalile. In most of the legitimate encounters, the people involved describe being physically examined or modified by the alien. In some cases, unusual pregnancies occurred, and in almost every instance, there were repeat visitations as though the Arielu Lalile were doing checkups on their subjects. We never got the chance to confront the Arielu Lalile about what they did to us and why. I wonder if we ever will. Would you like information on any other aspect of history? Sure. Anything else? Can you be more specific? That all depends on whom you meet, doesn't it, Captain? Well, in all seriousness, if you encounter the Ilrath, Buck, Androsynth, or other hierarchy battle thralls, I wouldn't hold out much hope for a peaceful encounter. So if you feel you have the advantage, attack. The resources you will scavenge from the enemy's wreckage are well worth the effort. If you can find alliance races who are in a position to help us, then you must convince them to join with us. Their assistance may be crucial to our success. Hmm, let's see. You need to build up and balance the strength of your flagship. I would add thrusters up to, say, five or six. Speed is essential in combat, but it would also pay off over the long haul in hyperspace. And if you prefer to avoid confrontation, nothing beats a great pair of legs. I would add turning jets for increased maneuverability. I would add enough weapons to defend yourself if you're caught without escort ships. You need more crew, at least 50 to make productive voyages into space. You need additional fuel, at least 50 units. Your weapons will be underpowered in combat if you don't have at least one dynamo. Use the resource units you have accumulated to improve your flagship. Captain, I wish I had an easy answer, but I don't. 
The only way I can see of liberating Earth as well as the Alliance allies is to destroy the Urquan and their armada of battle thralls entirely. What else can I tell you? Fine. Is there anything else you need? Return soon, Captain.
Big mean 
Hatta il alien nasella hovering overhead in an obvious attack posture. This is Patty Captain Swiffle. I know you are going to torture me, so let's just get this over with right now. The coordinates of my home world, Spatewa, are 241.6 by 368.7, and the ultra secret Spate Cipher, which is known only by me and several billion other Spate, is Happy Muffy Duffy. Sorry about that little mistake with your landing vehicle. I was uh, so startled when it approached my vessel in a threatening manner that uh, my automated defense systems fired on it when it got too close. I hope nobody got hurt. Are you sure? Because your statement is often just a more polite way of saying, Attention alien vessel, identify yourself or be destroyed. In any event, I am Spotty Captain Rico of the Void Ship Star Runner. Based here in this planetary system as part of the powerful Earth Tower, the Star Force, which our master, the Earth One, established here to make sure the Earthlings don't do anything tricky. About 20 years ago, this region of space was dominated by a loose confederation known as the Alliance of Free Stars, which was composed of the aliens native to these parts who did not want to be enslaved. They made a valiant effort against the superior Urquan forces. It even looked like they might miraculously defeat the combined Urquan armada, right up to the point at which the Urquan totally defeated, indeed annihilated them. When the Urquan armada entered the system to subjugate formerly the Earthlings, the Urquan presented the humans with the standard slave options. Join the hierarchy as combat roles and retain some autonomy including the right to travel through space, or become a fellow species and return to a free atomic savagery on the surface of their homeworld, encased for all time beneath an impenetrable force shield. The humans chose the latter option and so were swiftly imprisoned on the surface of Earth. But the Earth One didn't trust them to obey the restrictions, so they chose a small group of hierarchy combat starships from the Inlet and Spartan fleets to create the so-called Earth Guard and station them at a base on Earth's moon. <laughs> Originally, we were stationed on Earth's moon, which made us study a bit uneasy, because with each passing day, we grew more and more worried about the sneaky Earthlings making a surprise attack. But the Inred kept telling us that it was impossible, since the Earthlings had no ships or weapons whatsoever. That made us feel a bit better, but when the Ilrath left, again we grew fearful, and decided to make a strategic redeployment to Mars. Later on we decided it would be prudent to relocate to Jupiter's moon, Ganymede, then later Saturn's moon, Titan, and finally here to Pluto. The Ilrath contingent were supposed to be the toughest ridge crest, er, uh, the most rigid flipper, no, ah uh, yes, the backbone of the Earth Guard Force. But they departed the system on the mass not long after the last Earth Dreadnought vanished from this region of space. They claimed to have received a direct order from their gods of evil and darkness, who had grown dissatisfied with the Inrath's passivity and wanted them to kill, or at least, torture someone soon. Personally, I believe they just got bored and went off to have some fun. Well, when they were pushing up into hyperspace 18 years ago, we asked them that very question, and I think they said something to the effect of real soon. We decided that if the Earthlings figured out we had abandoned the base on Luna, they would be more likely to try something sneaky. So, we rigged up some old service androids and ordered them to drive around on the lunar surface in bulldozers, endlessly pushing around the same piles of dirt. In addition, we connected the base's local radio transmitter to an audio Melnorme fun rum called Winky's Happy Night hoping they would think we were still there. 
Over the past years, it became necessary to redeploy strategically some of our Earth Guard forces to our homeworld in case of a sudden surprise attack by a vicious, unrelenting alien race which we spotted call the Ultimate Evil! Thousands, that is to say, scores, and perhaps even hundreds of my brethren stride through the corridors of this specially modified, super efficient, mass destruction oriented starship, which could lay siege to an entire planetary system should we choose to do so. Which, fortunately for you, we have decided not to do today. I am undone! You are far too clever for a poor stuffy like me, and now I must submit to your superior alien intellect. I guess I am not revealing any truly important secrets if I tell you that each of my species' eluder class of board ships typically holds 30 stuffy crewmen. Though at present, my vessel, the Star Runner, is not up to full complement due to the needs of my homeworld in their resistance against the alternate evil. And in fact, my vessel is somewhat understaffed right now, seeing as how I am the only spotter on board, which is a bit frightening, as I am sure you can understand. How true, Captain, how true! In truth, just between us, during the past seven years, I have been quite ill at ease, and yet now I find myself enjoying your company. This witty dialogue, and in the presence of your huge, powerful, death-dealing starship, which, being my friend, you would certainly feel compelled to use in order to save me from any hostile lifeforms who threatened me with death. As yet, the ultimate evil remains largely unmanifest, and its powers and exact intentions are still a bit obscure, since it lurks just outside the range of even the most sensitive long-range detectors, which we feel gives conclusive evidence as to the ultimate evil's nefarious intent. Since it was our most powerful and unforgiving master, the Orquan, who stationed us here, we knew it would be grossly stupid to disobey them completely, but we decided it would be okay to send just one ship home. We used one of our most ancient and solemn rituals, Poon Taffy, to pick the lucky ship. Then, some months later, we decided that it wouldn't really hurt if we sent one more ship home. And then later we sent another, and then another. Well, you get the idea. Alas, as fate would have it, when the final ritual was performed, I, for Riffle, was left here alone. For, as even the most immature in wrestling knows, there must always be one stopper who puts the short top for the stick. Our masters don't really keep us very well informed about their goings on. So that all we know is that immediately after the subjugation of the last alliance race, the Yehat, I think, the Archon doubted their dreadnoughts and departed from the edge of the galaxy, commanding us to obey the slave laws or face their wrath when they returned. We only know bits and pieces of what happened to each race. For instance, when defeated, the Yahat joined the hierarchy as combat thralls, while the Cyrene chose to be slave shielded on a planet in the Bug Squirt Star System. No, that's not right. I forget its name. Anyway, where was I? Oh yes, the Shafikti. They were utterly wiped out in a gigantic blaze of glory. The Shofixti were half a serial, as you know, having been uplifted by the Yahat just a few decades before the start of the war. Given their habit of detonating those suicidal so-called glory devices in combat, it came as no particular surprise to me when, upon the arrival of the Orphan Primary Task Force at their homeworld, the Shofixti caused their sun to explode in a colossal supernova, destroying the entire planet system, and not incidentally, dozens of Earthworm dreadlocks! <laughs> me? You mean me, personally? How nice of you to ask! I was born a poor green in crafting, the youngest child of a family of 18,487. My male parents had to work hard to support us, very hard! But each of my brothers and sisters and I tried to help out to make ends meet. The female parent was kind and sweet to all of us. Why, she once even called me by name! 
She said, A golden memory. I swiftly matured into a fine example of my species with my parents' assistance, achieved independence, specifically they pried me from the door jam and rolled me into the street. Thus prepared, I set out to make my fortune. I had great dreams in those days, yes, great dreams! I knew that someday I would be vastly rich, wealthy enough to afford a large, well-fortified mansion. Surrounding my mansion would be vast tracts of land, through which I could slide at any time I wished. Of course, one can never be too sure that there aren't monsters hiding just behind the next push. So I would plant trees to climb at regular, easy-to-reach intervals. And being a spotty of the world, I would know that some monsters climb trees, though often not well. So I would have my servants place in each tree a basket of correct stones. Not too heavy, not too light, just the right size for throwing at monsters. I was thinking about what color the stones would be painted. Aqua, mauve, or magenta. When a bit of trouble, cart came careening down the street outside my house and knocked me unconscious. When I awoke, I was aboard the Lloyd ship Star Runner headed for Earth. Apparently, I had been out of my head for quite some time after the accident, and with the assistance of some kind strangers, had been relieved of my funds and convinced to join the Navy, where I have been unpleasantly employed for the last 25 years. Happy days and jubilation! I discard all prejudice and hesitation and accept and celebrate your offer of protection and your undying commitment to my well-being. I must wax melancholy for just a moment though. And make sure you understand that any other spotty ships we meet at large in the galaxy are not going to be quite so responsive to your friendly gestures as myself since they bear more heavily the yoke of Urquan in enslavement and are also apt to talk themselves out of a line with a totally unknown alien, which I, having been left here alone, cannot do. Welcome me aboard, Captain. Captain, I'm glad you made it back in one piece. Good work, Captain. Be careful out there, Captain. <laughs>